Another highlight of the first day of the United Nations General Assembly was Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky's address to the delegates. In a passionate speech, Mr. Zelensky said a nuclear-armed Moscow must be stopped from pushing the world to the final war. He also accused Russia of weaponizing everything from food to energy. The following report takes a look at the major highlights of President Zelensky's speech. Russia's invasion of Ukraine is a grave threat to the whole world, and Russia should have no right to hold nuclear weapons. This is the first talking point by President Volodymyr Zelensky as he begins his speech at the United Nations General Assembly Summit in New York. Russia, who deserved nuclear disarmament the most back in 1990s, and Russia deserves it now. Terrorists have no right to hold nuclear weapons. President Zelensky says Russia is using food supplies to pressure other countries to recognize captured Ukrainian territory as Russian, and he thanks those countries who have bought Ukrainian grains to resist those efforts. And it is a clear Russia's attempt to weaponize the food shortage on the global market in exchange for a recognition for some, if not all, of the captured territories. Volodymyr Zelensky says Russian forces were guilty of mass kidnappings of children from Ukraine and they were being taught to hate their home country. I have evidence on hundreds of thousands of others kidnapped by Russia in the occupied territories of Ukraine and later deported. The International Criminal Court issued arrest warrant for Putin for this crime. Those children in Russia are taught to hate Ukraine, and all ties with their families are broken. And this is clearly a genocide. The Ukrainian president continues his speech by listing other lethal threats beyond nuclear weapons. We see towns, we see villages in Ukraine wiped out by Russian artillery, leveled to the ground completely. We see the war of drones. We know the possible effects of spreading the war into the cyberspace. President Zelensky speaks next about his peace formula, which he says will end the war in Ukraine, and the fate of Wagner leader and former Putin ally Yevgeny Prigozhin highlights the perils of doing deals with Russia. The main thing is that it is not only about Ukraine. More than 140 states and international organizations have supported the Ukrainian peace formula fully or in part. The Ukrainian peace formula is becoming global. Its points offer solutions and steps that will stop all forms of weaponization that Russia used against Ukraine and other countries and may be used by other aggressors. The president of the war-torn country ends his speech with hopes that Russia's war will be the last in the world, saying Slava Ukraini as have left the stage. While Russia is pushing the world to the final war, Ukraine is doing everything to ensure that after Russian aggression, no one in the world will dare to attack any nation. Weaponization must be restrained. War crimes must be punished. And the occupier must return to their own land. We must be united to make it. And we'll do it. Slava Ukraini. Let's discuss the highlights on day one of the United Nations um, General Assembly. I'm joined by international affairs analyst Yuria Franceli. Thank you for joining us on the news this hour. The United Nations may be far from being united in the real sense of it, considering that four of the five veto-wielding permanent members of the UN Secretary Council are absent at the ongoing uh, General Assembly. What does this really mean for this year's summit and the type of consensus that is to be anticipated? Well, first of all, good afternoon. Thank you for having me here. We have to remember that the UN General Assembly is the main event, the main international event to gather leaders from all around the world to discuss the main uh, topics, the main challenges. And when uh, four out of the five members, permanent members of the UN Security Council 
are not present. Um, it shows, it points out for uh, an institutional crisis of the international organizations. Uh, and we also have to remember that this is not the first event this year that this happens. When you look back at the, G7, the, the, the G20 meetings in India, the same thing happened. Well, uh, Vladimir Putin was not present because he had this warrant against him by the International Criminal Court. And uh, also Chinese President Xi Jinping was another uh, international leader that didn't show up. So we have to, uh, it points out for um, a crisis of the international institutions. And if, we, if the leaders want to uh, sort it out, uh, find a common solution to this crisis, they at least should be together discussing this, which uh, is probably not happening, at least in this year's General Assembly. Again, we see in the Russian-Ukraine war headline in this event, yesterday we had an outright blame of Russia for its war in Ukraine, as echoed by Joe Biden and Zelensky. The central message was, if you allow Ukraine uh, carved up, how safe is the independence of every other nation? Do you think that the war in Europe uh, is taking the spotlight away from other leaders' appeals and priorities like the climate and economic crisis uh, at this event? I think some leaders, as for instance, for instance, Brazilian President Lula, uh, he, Brazil is traditionally the first country to address the General Assembly. So uh, we open the, uh, the debates every year. Uh, and I think Brazilian leader President Lula, he did a good job when it comes, for example, to uh, remembering the word of the disasters that are being caused by climate change. He mentioned the, the floods in Libya. He also mentioned uh, floods that we had back in the south of Brazil a few weeks ago. Um, and what I think that the discussion about the war in Europe does is that it brings out some resentment in the global south because uh, the global south think, and when I say the global south, I mean mostly African countries, Asian countries, Latin American countries. Uh, these countries, they feel that their problems are not being properly addressed by the Western countries, such as uh, European countries and uh, North American countries. Uh, when it comes to, for example, refugee crisis, uh, what happened right after the war uh, started? We, uh, we saw people in Europe opening their houses, uh, government making plans for to change to send money to people who hosted their uh, these refugees in the homes, and it, it is not something that happens when, for example, African refugees enter Europe. Uh, when we, when it comes to the COVID nineteen pandemic, same thing happened. Uh, absolutely, okay. uh, uh, um, I understand that. Um... Year in, year out, there are issues that seem to headline events of this nature. And you know, particularly uh, for some um, stakeholders who are also concerned about the economic realities back at home, uh, they're looking forward to how conversations like these can be genuine and you know, open-minded enough to also cater to them. But it was um, President Zelensky's first um, in-person appearance at the summit since the war began, and he's now questioned Russia's membership in the United Nations, calling on the body's dedication to protecting state sovereignty. He's also raised some very uh, um, concerns, grave concerns about um, using food and energy, uh, weaponizing food, nuclear power, uh, even weaponizing the possibility of weaponizing artificial intelligence. How important are these concerns, and how do you think the United Nations should be reacting? I think it's very difficult to say how the, the how the United Nations should act as an institution because Russia was condemned by the by the by a UN resolution last year. More than 140 countries voted for the condemnation of Russia. Um, but I think this debate has to be done in, in every other that is possible to find, for example, other forum uh, as, as the G20, as the, uh, the G7, everywhere that it can be addressed so countries can get together and find a common solution. When we see, uh, it's not very common for us to see Zelensky outside Ukraine, um, 
if we also pay attention, his speech was made in English, so it can be more moving for people that hear it everywhere in the world. He, Zelensky needs not only to try to convince world leaders to support him, but also he needs to touch the world's entire population because the money that is sent to Ukraine as military, as, as humanitarian aid, it is uh, money from the taxpayers' pocket that is not converted in national, into national uh, investment in health, education. So he needs uh, the general population of the world also to support him. He traveled to the United States with two main objectives. Um, the first one was to try to convince American Congress to release more than $20 billion in military and humanitarian aid to Ukraine. And the second one was to try to court the countries of the global south to help uh, break Russia's economy by uh, also uh, adhering to the international sanctions so uh, they can break Ukraine's um, e economy and thus uh, stop the war. Interesting days ahead, particularly now that we're hearing calls for greater collaboration amid what seems a clear global fragmentation. Uh, international affairs um, analyst Yuri Fonseli joins us live from Sao Paulo in Brazil. Thank you for talking to us. Thank you. It was my pleasure.